Welcome to 5 Minutes of American Literature. We continue this week's doubleheader with the second major cultural phenomenon of the 18th century, the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening was a series of early 18th century revivals that peaked around the 1740s. Some scholars discuss it as a backlash against the Enlightenment, and on one hand, that interpretation might be true. It was very consciously secular in a society where lots of people consciously identified as religious and believed in wonders and did not think that goodness is a matter of behavioral training. In 18th century British America, the Enlightenment perspective took root mostly among the educated or socially mobile, men of trade or business who had a wide network of contacts, who had reasons to keep up with current events, and who had cultivated a lot of acceptance of different creeds in the process. For people who did not move in those circles, the Enlightenment could look like the world moving away from God. On the other hand, other scholars don't consider it an accident that these movements unfold at the same time, because a lot of their features overlap. Like the Enlightenment, the Great Awakening emphasizes individual growth, self-improvement, community, public service. However, we see these priorities expressed in an overtly religious way that harkens back to the Puritans' belief system. Since they were no longer as dominant as they were in the 1600s, British America of the 1700s was more religiously diverse, but still heavily populated by people who identified as Protestant and who were already primed to see self-improvement as a conversion experience. Enter the evangelical mode of worship that exploded in popularity in the early 18th century, when evangelical services and ministers began attracting huge numbers of followers from all walks of life. The Great Awakening is notable for its racial and socioeconomic diversity and the relative equality among its participants, who tended to believe that true knowledge comes from experience of feeling and that personal growth comes from passionate devotion to God and sympathy for one's fellow man. Charismatic preachers traveled through the colonies and preached in open fields to whoever showed up. And the proliferation of newspapers in this period helped several of these preachers become celebrities. George Whitefield, one of the most famous preachers of the Great Awakening, held revival meetings that were attended by thousands of people. Most of this movement, however, took place in small, independent congregations and mission work and personal testimonies of faith that were published for the masses. To illustrate, let's look at the work of Samson Occam. Occam was born among the Mohegans, converted to Christianity at the age of 17, and left home to study English and biblical languages for several years with the New Light minister Eliezer Wheelock. He became a teacher and minister among the Montauk and delivered hundreds of sermons throughout New England. His rise to prominence was difficult, however. As what the white colonists called a praying Indian, Occam faced a lot of distrust and dismissiveness from white evangelicals. And as someone who ministered primarily to Native Americans, he and his mission work struggled with discrimination and neglect from evangelical organizations. Occam discusses these struggles in his spiritual autobiography, A Short History of My Life. It's an interesting look at what brought him to Christianity and how he pursued his ministry. His religious devotion gives birth to a desire for education, which he wants both to be a better Christian himself and to teach his fellow Native Americans. The nations of the Northeast had suffered a lot of conflict, displacement, and poverty since the British had arrived, and Occam had long believed that education offered a spiritual and intellectual enlightenment that would help indigenous communities effectively advocate for themselves. However, he never gets the support that white missionaries get, which he attributes to anti-native prejudice among white evangelical leaders, and his narrative ends with a sad acknowledgement that he can't rely on his brothers in Christ as much as he should be able to. Occam's sermon at Moses Paul's execution touches on some of the same themes of suffering, betrayal, and native identity, but in his role as preacher, he addresses them in a surprisingly optimistic way given the circumstances. He starts with the boilerplate assertion that sin is death and Christ's salvation is love and life. However, when he turns to apply these premises to the condemned Moses Paul, we can really feel the hope and sympathy and sense of common humanity that motivated Paul to invite Occam to preach at his execution. Occam essentially tells Paul, bro, you have really screwed up. You are standing at the gallows about to die, but as low as you have sunk, your life does not have to end here. And then he tells the rest of his audience, don't look down on this man, for we are all frail, dying creatures who struggle with sin. Regard him as an example and work to be more than your choices have made you so far. These are the themes that drew so many people to the Great Awakening. 
the idea that we're equal in sin, death, and the eyes of God, and the idea that you can always become a better person simply by opening your heart. They were especially attractive to the downtrodden and the marginalized, who didn't have the charmed life of a Benjamin Franklin, and therefore didn't really see themselves in the Enlightenment. As always, thank you for watching, let me know if you have any questions, and happy reading. Don't let hard text get you down.